Hey guys, it is Marcus and Terry with you today. Hopefully the new microphone setup and everything is working well and we have no echo. Today what we're going to do is we're going to talk about what happens after rehab if you relapse. This is a very common thing, seeing how the average success rate of rehab is around 5%, which is pretty bad. That means if 100 people go to rehab, 5 of them stay sober and 95 end up relapsing. Now, we have to keep in mind that with these numbers, it's kind of a rule of thumb because I went to rehab and I never once got a call to ask me if I was sober. So who knows, right? So we got to kind of take that with a rule of thumb, but we want to talk to you about the pitfalls and the hurdles that you're going to face when you get out of rehab and what kind of things are going to happen. What's going to happen when you get out of rehab, or maybe you just got out of rehab and you're like trying to navigate this new world of sobriety. So we're going to talk to you about that. We have personal experience from going to rehab. We have personal experience struggling with alcoholism and relapse and all kinds of things. And we want to bring that to you today so you understand exactly what's going on. So if the audio levels are good, let me know by typing something in the box. And Terry, you want to share with your uh, share with us your experience and uh, information on the rehab and, sure. and all that. I'm trying yeah, to get have, used to uh, hearing myself in the monitor, which is kind of weird. So hopefully you can get used to it. Yeah. And once again, let us know if we have any echo or sound problems or anything, folks. Um, good morning, everybody. Hey, Ty. Good to see you here. Uh, 500 days. Awesome, man. Congrats. Cool. Good job. You know, um, for me, uh, I ended up going to rehab. Oh, 2014 about may end of may 2014 somewhere around there and uh you know when i went i was desperate to quit i didn't have any other answers i didn't want to go to rehab none of that there was no way i wanted to go to rehab i didn't want to reach out for help or anything but that was that was the only choice i had all the other options were gone i'd tried everything limiting drinking all that stuff um trying to quit on my own, everything, everything less led back to the drink. So I went to rehab and I was a mess. I remember uh, like that first week I was there, it was, uh, it's kind of funny looking back on it, but it's not funny. But uh, I remember a couple of guys that were there and, and they were like, man, we vote you for the most messed up looking person coming in this place. <laughs> That's not an award you want. <laughs> <laughs> My face was like all round. I was a good 40 pounds heavier than I am now. I was, uh, I was in pretty bad shape physically, mentally, everything. But anyways, um, you know, I sobered up there and um, I got lots of good information. I learned a lot. I learned uh, what, it, what you're supposed to do to not drink. And I also learned how to sort of uh, play the game of rehab, too. And that's where things kind of went wrong. Um, I got out of rehab. And uh, part of that game that you had to play was, yes, I have a game plan when I get out. I'm going to go to meetings. I'm going to get a sponsor. I'm going to um, do everything I can to not drink. But I'm not going to an SLE, that's for sure. I'm not doing that. I'm going home. And that's what I did. I went home. And, you know, within a couple of weeks, I was drinking again. It was just, don't know why, but one day I was actually at a meeting, and I thought, I'm going to get a bottle of vodka on the way home. And I did. And I'm just going to have one drink. But, no, nope, three days later, I was full-blown, right back to that massive amount I was ingesting. <laughs> but, uh, you know, I did that for about another month. And, um, you know, why I didn't, why I started drinking again, you know, it's... You know, there anybody could come up with a lot of reasons, but really what it was, was deep down for me, I wasn't ready to quit. And that's, it's, it was almost, it's almost that simple. I mean, there's other factors, of course, you know, I didn't do the SLE, I didn't really have any in-home support and all that, but, you know, it, it was just, I wasn't ready. Mm-hmm. And that, I see that a lot with people I work with. Um... I work with a person now who he's been to rehab many times. He's been in the hospital many times. And we were just talking yesterday. Why? Why does it keep happening? And he just gets the efforts. It's like, might as well drink. I mean, he knows. He knows the second he starts, he's, you know, everything's out the window. The drink becomes number one. 
mm-hmm. and that's but he just can't can't get through it so we try to work every day try to work on what we're supposed to work on and what everybody says we're supposed to do and uh, hopefully it'll work out but really it has to come deep down in that heart we have one of our letters it's called the two foot drop and that's what it was that's what it took for me was was all that knowledge about alcoholism and how to recover had to drop down to my heart and I had to feel it I had to become sobriety I really had to to embrace it and not just go through the motions but believe that it's gonna work and believe in myself and start to take these steps that were necessary to stay sober and that's uh, that's kind of my journey as far as that last those last few months of battling with the alcoholism before I was able to just finally get it and start a program mm-hmm. and now it's it's not so much a battle anymore it's just uh, maintenance um, yeah. and ma- maintaining my sobriety and maintaining that sobriety has to be the most important thing for me absolutely and that's what yeah, I try to do and I think if we look at it it's very interesting because of the fact that you know when we get out of rehab or when we get sober talks or when we go to meetings one of the unforeseen side effects is we are really 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 dwelling on alcohol and it's interesting because i remember when i got out of rehab it was it was do or die for me it was like okay if i don't get sober i'm going to die i'm going to lose my family i'm pretty much lost everything up until that point and I didn't know what to do. So they said, hey, go to 90 meetings in 90 days. And I remember for me going to the meetings was very anxiety provoking. Like I hated it. Um, I actually, I had a love hate relationship with rehab. Um, I liked what I learned there because uh, my coach in rehab was like a very educated guy. And I like learning this stuff. Um, I didn't like the drama. The drama was difficult. There was a lot of drama in rehab where people were arguing, people were getting together, people were uh, leaving, you know, they just walk away and leave and come back the next day or whatever. Um, And it was very difficult to focus on my sobriety because human nature, we're social animals and, and, and we try to go and we try to blend in with the crowd. You know, we get those feelings of, you know, uh, there's the, the, the cool guy in the room. I want to be accepted. Or here's this guy. Or I don't want someone to beat the shit out of me, which was one of my big fears. Because, you know, there were some pretty, uh, you know, bigger guys than me. I, I'm a whopping five foot one on a good day if I have, you know, boots on. Um, <laughs> and it's it was difficult. You know, I was like, OK, am I going to die in here? I remember uh, the first day or one of the first days, uh, this guy was just angry as hell. And there was a little bucket that we used after we cleaned out the kitchen. And uh, he kicked the bucket, and it flew by my head. And I'm like, holy shit, this is, like, going to be difficult. And then there was, like, some um, all kinds of drama with with people on the outside and people on the inside, uh, which isn't usually supposed to happen. But, I mean, let's face it, it does happen. It's not a perfect, isolated environment. And I, I, I really had to say to myself, I'm going to take this stuff I don't care what everyone else is doing. You know, you meet people and you're like, hey, this guy's going to be my friend for life. Uh, These people are going to know me for life. And, you know, so far, I think Terry's the only person I still talk to uh, from rehab. And that probably wouldn't happen if we didn't start the show because it just it kind of dwindles out unless you unless you go with it. And one of the sad things is that so many of those people have relapsed. So many of those people have gone out. So many of those people have not stuck with it. And for me, my goal has always been to figure out why. You know, I'm, I'm always like, okay, Terry, what happened when you got out of rehab? What tools were not in place? And, and what caused you to get the vodka? You know, maybe it was going to too many things where it was talking about alcohol too much. Or maybe it wasn't having a tool. Or maybe it was just plain you weren't ready. You know, and we have to look at these things and we have to be on guard because your sobriety is up to you and you alone. And I don't care how many rehabs you go to. I think the record when I was in rehab was a guy who went 13 times. And I'm like, I don't know about you. I mean, I'm a businessman, so I do all right. But I really don't have the money to go to rehab 13 times. Like that's literally spending a year and a month of my life in rehab. And I didn't have that, so I was like, okay, what am I going to do? How am I going to deal with this? And how am I not going to relapse? And for me, 
I think the key is in focusing on what you're going to do rather than the drunkalogue. Because there's a lot of people, they'll tell, oh man, when I got drunk, and they glorify the drinking days. And for me, luckily, my drinking days were not glorious. They consisted of like trying to run a business meeting in Vegas and falling on my head and having to be carried up to my room. That, to me, I'm like, yeah, that's not glorifying. That's not good. Most of them were sitting in my house, uh, drunk off my ass, not able to do anything. And so I tried to separate and I tried to look at what am I going to do and how am I going to get all this noise out? Because sometimes you go to meetings and, and there's noise and there's shit and there's drama and there's talk and there's gossip. And you have to realize I'm here for me. I'm here because I need to get sober. And even my sponsor, if I want the sponsor route, even he is vulnerable to drinking. And so we have to focus on what am I going to do and what are the tools I'm going to do? Because I'll tell you right now, I don't know, uh, Terry, you could share your experience on this. When I got out of rehab, my wife drove me home and our drive was like two hours uh, from the rehab. And it's up all these windy roads, which make you feel like you're going to throw up and make you feel like you're drunk. And uh, we went to rehab in wine country, right? Very interesting. And um, driving home, I was able to spot a liquor store and a bar and even a gas station with alcohol from five miles away. They just, they stood out like crazy. And, uh, you know, I, I thought about drinking and, and that's all that was on my mind. I was like, oh my God, I'm out in the world. What am I gonna do? Um, and it was difficult and I had to combat it. And there were times when, you know, after rehab, I, I'd get in a fight with my wife and I'd go sit outside a bar in my car. Luckily, I didn't go in that time. And, um, I think, I think fighting it gives you the tools along the way that you need. Like sitting in that car outside the place thinking about getting a drink. For me, in a way, it's not a good idea. You don't want to go sit outside a bar and contemplate sobriety. That kind of is stupid. But in a way that helped me say, hey, you know what? I didn't go in that time. And I don't need to go in the next time. And I don't need to drink anymore. Uh, what was that like for you, Terry, when you got out and you had the tools and you're like, yes, let's be sober. And then it kind of life got in the way, so to speak. Well, you know, um, life did not really get in the way. I think part of what my problem was is I had nothing, nothing to do. I had nobody in my life except for my dog. Mm -hmm. And uh, that was it. And it was for me, there was a lot of boredom. And I think that's a that's a common thing. I hear that a lot. There's for a lot of people, there's a lot of boredom. For other people, there's total mayhem when they get home. Um, but uh, I had driven everything out of my life before I finally went to rehab. So I came home to an empty house. Um, I I do uh, relate to what Marcus said about noticing all the liquor stores and all that. And yeah. And I noticed how at the supermarket, all the liquors up front and over by the eggs and over by the produce and over by the fish and not to mention the liquor aisle, you know. Mm -hmm. So uh, it's it's a really hard thing to avoid. So that's something that uh, that you pretty much can't do on a daily basis if you're going to live your life. You can't you can't avoid seeing it, but you can't avoid drinking it. Um, you know, when when I got out, I did I didn't know what I was supposed to do and I went to meetings every day but I didn't open up to people so I wasn't able to relate to them so the, the people at meetings were those people they weren't me and until uh, I finally did get sober and start to open up and talk to people and and laugh and become friends with them and go out for coffee and stuff like that I then I finally learned that they're just like me I'm no different and that was that was uh, my experience as far as, um, you know, when I when I got out and started drinking again versus when I finally did stop drinking and, and I went back and worked on sobriety 100 percent. And that that um, opening up to other people and getting the help, that was that was the big difference and that allowed me to express those feelings that I had of just boredom mm -hmm. and frustration frustration about the things I've done that I still needed to fix, you know, and um, then these other people are like, oh, yeah, 
I've done that. Only I, I, you know, what I did was worse. Check this out, and then they'd tell me their story. I'd be like, oh, oh, okay. You know, we relate the uh, alcoholic relates to another alcoholic in, in a way that a sober person just can't. Yeah. And that was that was a big thing for me is just that that being able to talk to another person that can totally relate and that can laugh at the things that nobody else is going to laugh at. There, most other people would just be shaking their head like <laughs> you did what? But yeah. you know, the alcoholic kind of just uh, laughs and says, "Yep, yeah, I done that. Wasn't that stupid?" <laughs> you know. But uh, yeah, it was it was uh, it was a difficult thing coming out of. Uh, rehab that first time the people I see that come out after going many times it, it's it's even more frustrating they there's uh, somebody earlier mentioned shame about being sober and, uh, and the shame I'm t- gonna talk about is is more the shame of of going to rehab several times and then having to go back and maybe you go in the rooms or or just anybody that's involved with your life and they're like yeah you went to rehab again whatever you know and they're just sick of it and the shame involved with the person that just keeps going in and out it's it's hard and that's a really hard thing to get over and and if you can't just push that shame aside for a little bit then you're going to end up isolating and then that isolation it could cause you to drink again i mean that's a that's a a very high thing on the list the isolation as to why we drink we have nothing else to do and that's that's what i did i you know i isolated and then started drinking again and had had nobody in my life to keep me accountable or anything and there you go i was off and running absolutely and i think part of the issues are one one of the things i learned is that feelings of boredom or feelings of of discontent or Um, any feeling you have is not going to kill you. Like, you're going to be okay. Like, I could live through boredom. I was a teenager, and I lived through boredom. Like, teenagers are some of the most bored people ever, if you've ever had teenagers. And um, somewhere along the line, we make the excuse that these little feelings in our life need to be drank over. And when we do that, we're kind of positioning ourselves to look at alcohol as a solution for everything. And that's when we become alcoholics, when alcohol is the solution for everything in our life, boredom, anxiety, stress, um, you know, anything, sadness, grief, happiness, uh, congratulations, feelings, um, all these things, we turn to alcohol. And when we go through rehab, we learn, you know, hey, these feelings, like you can live with them. And one of the things that I really learned in rehab Uh, Because for me, rehab was basically 30 days of nonstop level nine anxiety, level on a one to 10. It was like a nine. Uh, It peaked to a 10, but, you know, it was like a base level nine. And uh, I realized, hey, I did that and I didn't die and I didn't have alcohol. And I'm, I'm okay. And then throughout life, you learn, you know, you have the passing of a loved one. I made it through that. I didn't drink. You have issues at work made it through that, didn't drink, have issues like the world issues going on right now, and I don't think there's anything with the world that's like that positive in the news right now. There's lots of negative. I'm sure there's lots of positive as well, but unfortunately the news doesn't cover that. Um, And, you know, how do we make it through these? And I think the key is when you get sober, whether it's at a rehab, whether it's at home, you need to have a plan of action. What am I going to do? Right? For Terry... You know, you look at it, he got out of the rehab, he went to the meeting, and he was like, I'm going to get vodka. That's what I'm going to do. And there was no plan to to intersect it. There's no plan to say, wait a minute, is there someone I can call? Is there a different route I can take home? Is there, uh, can I go to the, the vodka place and say, hey, I'm an alcoholic, don't sell me vodka. You know, I mean, sometimes you have to do stuff that that rash. I remember... Uh, there was a, a bar restaurant that I would go to for lunch, and I went there all the time. And I didn't really want to give up the restaurant. And, you know, in order to do that, I'd have to give up every restaurant because almost everyone has uh, alcohol. Uh, I had told the bartender that was always the regular at lunchtime. I said, I'm an alcoholic. Don't bring me my drink anymore. Um, and she was very uh, helpful with that. And, and I felt that, you know, saying that meant something. And I think that's part of the deal like admitting i'm an alcoholic and i can't stop 
is part of the battle. You know, you have the stigma, you have the what are people going to say, but I think coming out and saying this is this is what I've decided to do, this is who I'm going to be, um, it kind of flips a switch in your brain to where it's like off the table. And for people who relapse, alcohol isn't really off the table. Hey, it's, it's still a little bit. Like I hear some people in the chat that are like, well, what about, you know, if I if I get sober from alcohol, but I smoke pot? Okay, now for me, that doesn't work. The reason it doesn't work is one, uh, that makes me very anxious. And two, it's kind of like not being sober, in my opinion. Now there's some people who do that and they're fine. For me personally, I choose not to do it because for me, I don't want anything to alter my brain and I'm very, very sensitive about stuff. Like I'm sensitive about too much caffeine, sensitive about too much sugar, too much Diet Coke. Sometimes if I have too much Diet Coke, I get um, irritated and angry. And I'll go throughout my day and I'm like, why am I pissed off at stuff? I'm like, ah, it's Diet Coke, of course. You know, I don't know what's in it. You know, some kind of anger juice or something. Um, but I find that these things happen. And, and for me, I know that the slightest off balance is going to tip me. I'm like one of those tops that's standing on one leg and boop, you tip it over a little bit. It's going to go over. And so I choose not to dabble in things. Now, I have a brother who's sober and you know, he goes and he dabbles in stuff and I don't know how that's going to last long term. That's not for me to decide, but I know for me personally, it's not a good idea. And even when I uh, went to non-alcoholic beer, it was a big thing. I set a plan in place. I said, kids, wife, I'm going to have this because, you know, up until that time I made hop tea, which uh, stinks up the house. And if you don't make it right, it tastes like crap but you feel like you have to drink it anyway because you're like, I made all this stuff. There's absolutely no alcohol in it. And so I, I was like, hey, you know, Heineken Zero came out with a 0% um, alcohol beer. Like, there's none in it, uh, none that you can register. I think, like, a banana has more alcohol or something like that. And so I decided to try it, but I set a plan in place where I said, hey, guys, I'm going to watch this, and I want you to keep me accountable for this. And, and I, I went in saying, I'm going to drink this, not with the idea of, oh, crap, I can't have alcohol, so I guess I'll have this. No, I went in with, hey, you know what, I, I'd like an alternative to the drinks I'm drinking because Diet Coke pisses me off or whatever. And, and so I went that route, but I was very careful with it. And I would advise whatever you're going to do, get a group of people you can talk to about it. You know, maybe even come on here and say, hey, guys, this is what I'm doing. I'm trying to stay sober. Here's my struggle. It's when I go to the grocery store or it's when I get in a fight or when it's when I'm alone, right? And keep yourself some kind of accountable and maybe find someone else that you can be accountable to uh, going to meetings, right? Sometimes those are great for accountability. People will see you. They don't see you in a while and they're like, hey, where you been, buddy? You been drinking? No, no, no. Or yeah, you know, and you can kind of share uh, with that because I think rehab is looked at as a cure, and it's not a cure. There is no cure. Alcoholism is a lifestyle cure. It's a lifestyle change. The only way to cure or get better, if I want to use those words, which, by the way, Terry and I are not doctors. We're just two guys who, who got sober, and uh, we had some pretty extreme examples where we had to get sober. And when you use these things, it's like, okay, what am I going to do? Well, I need to make a life that I no longer have to drink myself out of. So I need to do, and whatever that looks like for you, you got to figure it out and you got to make plans. Now, first out of the gate, you get out of rehab and you're like, hey man, I went through rehab. Look at me go. Congratulations, I didn't drink in a place where there was no alcohol. Yay me, pat myself on the back. But when you get into the real world, you got to have these plans and you have to have these things in place so that you know what's going to come your way and you know what to do. You know, I'm going to get out of rehab and I'm going to be anxious as hell. I'm going to get out of rehab, and all those feelings are going to flood back because I was just in an isolated bubble, and it was all about me. And now I got people, and my kids are coming to me, and they're like, Dad, what did you do when you drank? What the hell's the matter with you? Or my wife comes, and she's like, do you realize what you did to our finances and our life? And all these things pile up, but we kind of like hide ourselves from them. But we got to look at them, and we got to be real about them, and we got to say, I'm going to deal with these sober because if I deal with them drunk, I'm probably going to end up back where I was. And you get a plan. You say, what am I going to do when, when I get the screw it, I'm out 
What am I going to do? You know, how am I going to self-talk? There's little things you can say to yourself where you say, hey, you know what? Screw it. I'm out. Okay. And for me, in my mind, it says, well, is that really a good idea? Is that really going to help? Is alcohol really going to help the situation? Like, I don't think anyone got fired from their job, went and drank, and the boss called them up and said, hey, are you plastered? Good. You got your job back. Never happens. Right. So we got to look at this and we got to look at it objectively and we got to realize that a sober life is a way better life than a drinking life for the drunk. Way better. Like I look at it now and my best day drunk is worse than my worst day sober. And we look at that and I'm like, man, how could I live this way? And now that I'm, you know, six years sober, six years out of rehab, I look at it and I'm like, how the hell did I live this way? How the hell did this even function? How did it work? You know, and then you realize things when I went to 4th of July, because it was around this time of the year that I got sober and, and out of rehab and I got out and, um, you know, 4th of July, time to drink. And it, it, we think about it. And I was like, no, I can't do that. I'm not going to do that anymore. I'm going to enjoy the things I have in my life because those are what I'm trying to get by drinking. I, I'm trying to feel good. And all these things around me can make me feel good, but I'm drinking, which makes me feel bad, which sort of makes me feel good. And it's just a convoluted clusterfuck of lying to yourself. And that's what we have to look at. And we have to look at the alcohol talking versus us talking. And in the beginning, it's very difficult. What are you going to do? What am I going to do to stay sober? Yeah. And, you know, you were talking about how you had to be honest with yourself and Hey, narcissist, uh, you, you know, you said, wake up and sweat again. Another's day been laid to waste in my disgrace, stuck in my head again. Feels like I would never leave this place. There's no escape. I'm my own worst enemy. I've given up. And, you know, what Marcus was talking about, you know, we're uh, Marcus and I have, have some years of sobriety, but we were there, man. I mean, we're, we're not doing these things that we're talking about are, are just tools that we've learned. I was there. I've given up. That's what I had to get to for me. I had to get to the point where I gave up. I didn't know what to do. All I could do was think about trying to quit, but I wanted to drink and I kept drinking, woke up in the sweat. You know, earlier, I think it was David, but somebody mentioned um, waking up and I had to drink because um, of the nausea. I was there. I had to drink because wake up and I was nauseated and I drink and it would go away. You know, there's all these things. And I had to give up. I had to surrender. And after I surrendered, just basically, you know, I've given up. I don't know what to do. That's when I was able to get honest with myself. I didn't even worry about being the honesty with other people, although that came. But I had to be honest with myself that I did not have the answer. So narcissists, go to the doctor. It's a hard thing to do. That was the, That was one of the things that kept me from getting sober was reaching out but that's what I had to do I went to the doctor and they were able to steer me in the right direction and other people talk about uh, AA didn't work for me that that's fine that's great but you got to go to a doctor and have them at least give you some different options my opinion is as far as different ways to find recovery is try everything with an open mind and just stay open and, and it's okay you you can do you can do AA you can do life ring or all these smart recovery you can do whatever you want or you can do all of them and then you can quit in two days if you don't like it or I would suggest trying whatever for at least a month and see if it's you're getting any results out of it look at it objectively and honestly are you being successful or not but you know that's that's part of the journey for many of us alcoholics is we have to get to that point of I've given up. Absolutely. And I think also uh, Narcissist, by the way, is his screen name. We're not being mean to people here. That's what his screen name is. Uh, just so you guys know. Uh, I would take a look at what you're saying to yourself. Because here's the deal. You, you say, I woke up in a sweat. Another day is laid to waste. Uh, stuck in my head. Okay, we want to look at these things and we want to say, you know, what am I saying to myself? Because we all tell ourselves stories and you're telling yourself a story of this is the way I think my life looks. 
and I'm stuck in my own head. Now for me, that was the thing. I thought I was stuck in my head and I was because I didn't know a different way. And then I realized like, what's my head anyway? Like, am I really stuck in my head? And my hands are down here, my feet are down there. My head's up here. I'm not stuck in my head. Like I can't literally go up and crawl in my head and get stuck in it. So what am I actually? Well, I'm stuck in thoughts. Okay, so if I'm stuck in thoughts, what is a thought? Well, a thought is a chemical impulse in the brain that describes something. And what, how do we describe things? Well, we describe things with words. And the English language is words. And we look at it and we're like, okay, so the English language is words. That's what I'm using to describe my feelings and my, my thoughts and my ideas and put them together. And I didn't even invent the English language. So I'm using some software called language that someone invented to describe things that are going on in my head, which most of them aren't even real. And then I think I'm all done. My life's over. I'm stuck in my head. I can't get out. And, and I, I feel this way. And, and maybe you're like me. I felt poetic, right? I was the martyr. Oh my God, I can't get out of my head. I, I am trapped by my own head. I mean, how bad does it get? You got people who are bankrupt. You got people who are this and that. And here I am trapped in my own head. How poetic is that? And I look at it and I'm like, I'm not trapped in my own head. I just think I am. Why? Because a mind is like a lens and you get what you focus on. And I guarantee if you're there and you're in your thoughts and you're freaked out and something happens, a fire alarm goes off in your house. Beep, 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 beep. beep. All of a sudden you're out of those thoughts. You're not thinking about you anymore. You're thinking about your house on fire and how you're gonna get out and calling the cops and we gotta get the dogs and the rabbit and the cat and you know the kids out to the front and all of a sudden you stop thinking about this thing. Why? Why did I stop thinking about it? Why am I not in that trap anymore? Well, because my mind is like a lens or you're sitting there and you're completely in your thoughts of how you've destroyed your life and you look at your lottery ticket and you look at the screen and the numbers start to match and all of a sudden, all the feelings go away. Nothing in your life has changed externally other than numbers on a paper that you believe are going to make you rich. And you might even be reading last week's numbers and getting excited about nothing. And we look at this and there's certain things that break us out of it. And what we need to realize is thoughts are not real. The average person has like 60,000 thoughts a day. 60,000. The amount you're dwelling on probably isn't that much. And what happens is you train your brain. So here's the deal. When you have thoughts and you feel like you're stuck in your brain, I want you to think of your thoughts like a river. It's like a river going by in front of you. Picture that nice, peaceful river. And what happens is the more things happen, let's say you watch the news a lot. How many of you guys, honestly, if you say, well, you know, Marcus, all of a sudden, I'm thinking about viruses, masks, and government stuff, right? For the last three months, those thoughts have been in your river like crazy unless you're isolated on some continent that doesn't talk about this stuff. But it, most people, it's been directed. Your thoughts have been directed by something else. Something else. And so we look at that and we're like, wow, my mind is literally controlled by what I put in front of it. And now it's controlled and I have these thoughts and I'm taking them serious and I'm looking at them as real things like the Bible verse, which I think is one of the most misquoted and damaging Bible verses in the Bible, as it were, is um, take every thought captive and the verse is about as a man thinketh, so is he. Okay, do we need to take every thought captive? Is this a war in our brain? No. It's a bunch of chemical impulses that are bringing up recollections of things that are going on around us. It's like when you want to buy a new car, you're like, I'm going to buy the new red convertible. All of a sudden you drive on the road and there's all these red convertibles. You're like, what the hell? Is it national red convertible day? Is there more? Did they produce more? No. Your mind simply notices them because it's tuning into it. And your mind's like a radio station and it's going to tune in to things that you're focused on. Right now, most people are turned into, uh, tuned into uh, doom and gloom, news, politics, and viruses. That's what they're tuned into. That's why so many people are miserable right now. That's why, uh, you know, drinking is skyrocketing right now. Why? 
because it's a lens. But what happens if we don't take it seriously? What happens if I sit back and I say, well, you know, uh, the odds of getting this are, are not that big. And there's things we can do. We can wash our hands and wear a mask. And I think I'm going to be okay. But if you sit and dwell on it, that's the difficulty. And when you take your thoughts serious, this is what alcohol does. It makes it serious. You go to the bar and you drink and the guy at the bar is like, can I, can you hand me the peanuts? And you get mad at him for no reason. Cause you're like, what am I? Some goddamn peanut hander person. Why don't you ask the bartender? You're asking me, you know, and you get mad. Why? Because you take these things seriously and alcohol makes the ability to change your thoughts and the ability to change your focus completely worthless. You want a way to stay in your head? Keep drinking. Guarantee it. You'll stay in your head. Why? Because alcohol makes you think about me, 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 only me, 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 me. And the way to get out of your head is to say, you know what? I'm one of 8 billion people going through the human experience. That's it. I used to look at life as something that happened to me. So it happened to me. It's happening to me. The virus happened to me. It's damaging my business, my life, my stuff. No, it's like pretty much happening everywhere, right? It's not just me. And we have to look at it and focus and, and say, what am I going to do? And how am I not going to take these thoughts serious? Because they're not real. 99% of the thoughts you worry about never come to pass. I know because I worry about them too. And they never come to pass. Sometimes something bad will happen. Sometimes something good will happen. But dwelling on it makes our whole life bad. And if we focus and we say, hey, you know what? Focus on sobriety. Today I woke up, the sun's out. It's a little hot in here and the air conditioner's not doing its job, but the grass is nice. Got a pool I can jump in. I'm doing all right. Kids are okay. We're all right. And we focus on that. We say, you know what? Shit's not real. I got this voice in my head that's talking to me incessantly. But who the hell said I had to listen? Right now I have to listen to myself because the microphone goes into here. But luckily, I don't take my thoughts seriously, right? <laughs> and we got to look at that. We got to focus and say, I don't need to worry about this stuff. It's going to be okay. It's going to pan out. Be all right. Yeah. You know, Hunter, you just uh, you just mentioned I'm sick of feeling. Is there nothing you can say? Take this all away. I'm suffocating. Tell me what the F is wrong with me. What Marcus was just saying, try to change your focus. And, you know, the, the simplest way to change my focus that I found is the gratitude. Marcus just mentioned that. he's He can go jump in the pool. You know, he's changing his focus. He's changing on what what he can do. You know, there's a lot of frustration. You know, I go out and there's these people not wearing masks or whatever, you know, and I'm sitting there judging them and I just got to think, well, okay, they're not affecting me right now, but they, of course, that can affect me. I'm not wearing a mask because it can cause whatever to happen, but right now they're not affecting me. And really me walking up to them and telling them to put a mask on is, are they going to do it? No. So I can take care of me. I can be responsible for what I do and I can, um, you know, be, just be a good example. And that's what I do with alcohol as well as I just try to be good, try to be a good example. But I focus on the good things that I have. I have some good things. When I first got sober, I didn't have a lot of good things, but I did have sobriety. Even though it was just very, very short time, I had a little bit of sobriety. I had a couple of some people that loved me in life. I have my dog there. I could, I could have just, I, and in fact I did because I learned that a gratitude list is, is important, but I can think of many things that I had was grateful for, even though I had a lot messed up in my life, but there was just as much that was, that I was able to be in gratitude with. And when I do that, my focus goes towards the positive side of things. And then I'm able to laugh at silly situations I'm able to go through the day and not get sick of that feeling because I'm happy and I'm not so frustrated. I Sure, the frustrations are still there. They don't get buried completely. They're still there. But I'm focusing on the happiness and then I'm just taking those little things that are that I have the problems with. Take one thing. Okay, 
this is an issue, maybe I'll take care of this today. And then if I don't get it done, I don't stress about it. Okay, I'll try it again tomorrow. Maybe I can get it done tomorrow or get a piece of this thing done, piece of this problem fixed, something like that. And that works for me. It worked for me then. It works for me now. Trying to be as positive as possible. You know, um, Armando was talking about that he now has seven weeks and he's his runs usually go fairly long. And that's great. Seven weeks is awesome. Be proud of that. So many people, including me, I couldn't get freaking 10 minutes. <laughs> so, you know, that's awesome. Romo Cop, you're back. Welcome back. I remember seeing you before and seeing you here off and on and two weeks sober. That That's great. Good job. It's hard when you keep relapsing. I understand that. It's, it's a difficult thing. But focus on having those two weeks and try and get another two weeks or just try and get today. That's okay. That's great. One day is incredible. Absolutely. So, yeah. And, and also watch your, your self-talk because I hear a lot of people, and I was super guilty of this, and I still am sometimes. You know, we use words like uh, back in the 1920s, late 1920s, uh, early 30s, they would ex- explain the stock market as a bloodbath. Like, oh, a bloodbath on the stock market today. It's like, was there actually a bloodbath? No, I don't, I don't think so. Did people lose numbers on papers that eventually came back? Yeah. Did a lot of people end their lives over a short-term problem? Yeah. And eventually it, it bounced back. I mean, times were tough for a while, sure. But I think we need to realize that life is a journey, not a destination. And it's interesting because when I look at myself drunk, um, I was in a, a big house in California, uh, bigger than the house I have now, and um, I was miserable. You would think, oh, he's got the bigger house, he's in California, he's got everything he wants, he's doing okay, he should be okay. And I'm actually happier now because I appreciate the things in my life. I even appreciated we had to uh, get a rental for a while because I flipped out when I went into rehab and sold my house completely drunk and we had nowhere to live. And I was like, okay, well, we better get something short term. I was even happier there than I was in the big house because I realized that my life and all the things I told to myself, all the stories and the ways that I described everything was absolute bullshit. I realized that I'm sitting here and I'm comfortable and we use words like I'm suffocating. Well, if you're really suffocating, go to the doctor. It's kind of like a kid. If you've ever had kids uh, or been around kids, you realize that they throw fits and, and, and everything's the end of the world. It's always the end of the world, right? And it's because they haven't developed the ability to cope. And it's the same with alcoholics. We haven't developed the ability to cope. And we look at these things and this is the end of the world or I'm suffocating or the stock market was a bloodbath or um, my job's going down the tubes or, you know, I feel shitty. Do you really feel like a piece of poop? I don't think so. Do you feel a little off? Yeah, it's like a headache. You get a headache? Um, I could sit there with a headache and I could bitch and complain about my headache. And guess what? It's the worst headache I ever got. But if I sit there and I'm like, I got a headache, it'll pass, I'll be all right, drink some water, be okay, right? It's the dwelling on it that really keeps us stuck. And when you dwell on these things and you obsess over these things because you feel like you have to, because there's this voice in my brain and I got to pay attention to it because it's there. Well, who the hell said you got to pay attention to it? Sometimes you don't pay attention to it, clearly. Sometimes I don't, clearly. And we look at it. And we focus and we say, you know what, we're, we're going to be okay. And we're going to go through this and, and some days are bad, some days are good. But all in all, we're okay. I'm alive today. And it's all right. You know, and we look at it and we're like, I don't need to listen anymore. I don't need to stress about these things anymore. Um, there's a good talk that I listened to years ago. Kind of an interesting guy. Had a controversial, like, self-help movement kind of thing. Um... It was Werner Erhard, and he, he talks about how there's the guy that always says, life is tough. Life is tough. And he talks about, you know, there's a guy who says, life is tough, and I'm tougher, so I'm going to do it. Or life is tough, and, and that's why it's so hard, and it's difficult, and I, I have a hard time at life. And it's all about the way you describe it. We're all doing just as good in life, like all of us are. If you're alive, you're doing just as good, from the guy who sits and does nothing to the guy who runs multinational corporations. It's all the same. We're alive. Now, 
we might put value on things and say, this guy's valuable because he has a Bentley, or this guy's valuable because he runs a charity, or that guy's valuable because, you know what? He's in the movies. He's a Hollywood star. And we look at it and we say, that's a life. My life sucks because theirs is good. Well, maybe your life doesn't suck. Maybe you need to look at the things that are good. Maybe we need to stop comparing these things. And maybe we need to look at it and say, this is all society's thing. Like, who gives a rip? Who cares if I have an old car or a new car? Who cares if I have a big house or a little house? Who cares? What matters is I'm sober and I got people around me and I do what I like to do. And that's pretty much all I can ask for. Because as Alan Watts said, you can only eat one roast beef at a time. You can't eat 20 of them. You can cook them, you can have them. You can only drive one car at a time. Realistically, in your house, you can only occupy about two square feet, maybe six if you're laying down. That's it. All the rest is just nonsense. Well, I want a house with 17 bathrooms. You can't shit on 17 pots at the same time. You can't do it, right? And so you look at it and you say, all these things are just in my mind and thrown at me by society. And we have to realize that you're watching society through a screen. Whether it's Instagram, whether it's YouTube, whether it's Facebook, whether it's TikTok, whatever it is, you're watching it through a screen and it's not real. It's like uh, there's a verse in the Bible. I don't know why I'm Bible-y today. It's just coming up. I used to be a preacher. Not anymore, but I used to be. Uh, So it comes back sometimes where he says, uh, you know, they worship the creation rather than the creator. And there's an old Zen koan that says, you know, um, it's like a finger pointing at the moon. And the finger's saying, hey, look at the moon. And you're sitting there going, whoa, check it out. Look at the, uh, you know, the, the, the markings. That's a big finger. You should probably clip his toenails or his fingernails, right? And you're looking at the finger rather than looking at the thing it's pointing to. And you're living your life looking at the finger rather than what it's pointing to. And what's it pointing to? You can be happy right now. You choose to be. Choose to be happy right now. And you look at it and you're like, I'm going to be okay. I don't need to worry about stuff. And there's some things I got to worry about. You know, my roof has fallen off and it's going to rain tomorrow. Might want to get some duct tape. But all in all, the way we describe it is, this fucking house is a piece of shit. I, it's a, just a money pit. Is your house really a money pit? No. Like, you have a house and you got to fix stuff. It's the way of the world. It's what happens. You're not alone. There's lots of houses that need to be fixed. People in in India who have houses made out of, like, tarps. And there's actually studies that show they're happier than the middle class in America. Interesting. So we got to look at where we get our happiness, and we got to focus on it and say, this is something I can, I can control and I can put the lens of my mind on. One of the things I do to, to affect my lens is I listen to talks every night. And I notice certain talks I listen to make me feel a certain way. Even though I sleep through most of it, somehow it's still being heard and it affects my day. And, and, you know, I listen to something positive or upbeat, it helps me. I listen to something zen, it helps me calm. I, sometimes I'm not motivated, I listen to something motivating. Guess what? The next day, holy crap, as if by a miracle, I feel kind of motivated. So we got to look at it. If I watch the news all day, every day, or at night, I'm gonna feel like shit the next day. Why? Because, you know, put bad stuff in. Put bad in, get bad out. Focus the lens on the wrong stuff, it's gonna be bad. Um, But we can focus the lens where we want, and we can choose to focus it, and we could direct it, and we can be in charge of, hey, I'm gonna put this stuff in, sometimes it's gonna work, sometimes it's not, but all in all, I'm gonna have a better experience over time. And I'll shut up now. Oh, you're good. You're fine. <laughs> Keep going. No, okay. I'll, I, I I'll feel talk. so fancy with my new microphone, like I'm on <laughs> a show. Huh? It looks kind of like looks kind of like mine. There you go. <laughs> Anyways, microphone's a microphone, I guess, but apparently yours is better now, so that's good. Well, it's got a you headphone, know, so I can listen to you through that. Right on. You know, a lot of a lot of people have been talking about the depression and and stuff like that, and the negative feelings and. Yeah, and, and I, I try to focus on the positive, but at the same time, I realize that, you know, de- depression is there. It's real. And and uh, sad things 
happen. I get angry, things like that. You know, right now my dog is actually literally dying, and uh, and it's slow. And you know, I cry every day. But what I really try to focus on is what can I do for him to keep him comfortable because he's not ready to go yet. And that's what I try to do. And I try to, and when I'm around him, I don't cry. I try to be positive. They can pick up on that. And I just do what I need to do next. You know, I realize that it could happen today. It could happen in a week. Could Maybe he'll go for a month. I don't know. But I just, I just take care of what's in front of me next. And that keeps me from getting too depressed. I'm going to, of course, it's going to be horrible when he has to, when he goes. And it's, it's terrible right now. But these are the things that we have to deal with on a daily basis in life. And sometimes it's not so fun, but it's just, it's a feeling and it's a real feeling and it's okay. It's okay for us to have those feelings. It's not okay for me to go drink over it, to push it down because it's just going to come back worse. So why would I do that? So I just want to give that perspective just so, you know, I'm not trying to be the, the super happy guy all the time. It just doesn't happen. I have to look at life real, realistically. People are going to make me angry. When, they, when people make me angry, I have to step back and pause. We talk about taking that 15 minutes if you get a craving for a drink and take 15 minutes and do something else. Well, that's the same thing with anger. I get angry, take 15 minutes, walk away. You know, when I was uh, going through a divorce years ago, um, we kind of did it over, did the communication through email. And an email would come through and make me mad. And I'd type this answer. And the first time I sent it, and I was like, oh man, why did I say that? Why did I send that? And then after that, I decided, okay, what I'm going to do is I'm going to type, I can go ahead and type it, but I can't send it. I wait till the next day. It's okay. She can get an answer the next day. And the next day, every single time, I change that answer 100%. And the uh, divorce went much smoother. Um, We're actually, we're on good terms now. And things, you know, things are a lot better. And that's because I took that 15 minute, well, overnight. But still, I took that pause when I was angry. And there's a way to deal, deal with these negative I guess you could call them negative feelings, but really all they are is just feelings. Are they positive or negative? They don't make us feel good, but we're human. That's part. If we didn't have bad feelings, how would we know that we have good feelings? You know? Absolutely. So it's part of life. I see you. Good to see you. Awesome. Um, Guys, if you want to help support the channel and get lots of cool uh, audios, videos, PDFs, and everything to help you get and stay sober, uh, you can go over to TalkSober.com, click on the big yellow button, join the recovery class. This will go through. It'll get you access to it. Uh, It's a work in progress, so some of the things are being updated from time to time, but that's why we have it at a very good discount, which is less than the price of a cheap beer a day not even a good drink just like a cheap beer i think you know my non-alcoholics are more than that um so you can go in there and you can get this you just put your first name last name email put all your info in here it's completely secure we use stripe which is like a huge company um and you can cancel whenever you want but i would definitely go in there and check out the stuff because if our talks resonate with you and you want to get more help on hey how do i get and stay sober how do i make a plan to stay sober how do i combat these things how do i build a new life how do i um go about my relationships how do i do this stuff and and change my thinking in sobriety uh what we've done is we put together over 30 different letters that were written from me to you. Uh, Terry's gone in and made videos and worksheets on the letters that you can go through for 30 days. And even if you're already sober or been sober a while, I think these are good to brush up because we never know what's going to happen. And as I learned in rehab, it's always the one you don't see coming that's going to get you. And what this is going to do is it's going to help you get the tools and help you go through the process and have those aha moments and the two foot drop that Terry talked about earlier that's going to get you on the path to sobriety. Now, I will say Terry and I are not doctors. This is just something that we've put together out of our own experience. And what did it take for us to get sober? And this is 
coming from years of researching, six years sober, and I even researched sobriety before I got sober because as you can see behind me, I'm a nut and I have to research everything. Um, but this will get you ready to rock and roll. You just go through, fill this out, and um, you'll get instant access uh, via email, and you'll be able to log in and get those letters and the videos and the PDFs and even MP3s that you can download and put on your phone or MP3 player or in your car. And this helps us support the channel so we can get microphones that actually work. Uh, without echoes and everything like that, and uh, keep everything rocking and rolling. Also, if you do want to just support the show like a one-time deal, you can go to TalkSober.com, click on Support Our Work, and you can do a one-off, hey, you know, we like your show, we want to help you out. Uh, you just use a little slider, however much you want to give us as a tip or a uh, whatever you call it. Uh, you could do that, and that'll be a one-time thing, and we really appreciate that. And uh, our goal is to spread the word and help lots of other alcoholics because one of the things that both of us found lacking when we got sober was good information. No one out of uh, rehab or anywhere else could sit there and say, this is what's going on with you. And I think that's why we resonate with so many people because we've been where you're at. We know what you're going through. I know what it's like to like hide beer in sheetrock and alcohol in sheetrock and then go get it and bruise your arm because you feel like if you don't get alcohol, you're gonna die. And if you feel that way, number one, go to a doctor and tell them, hey, I feel like I'm gonna die without alcohol. Can you give me something for detox or help me through detox or whatever it is? Um, and then second, you know, go through the talk sober stuff and learn the tools. Guys, these tools are out there. These tools came at the biggest price to me, which almost cost me my life. These tools had to be developed or there was no other way. And so I've put those together and you can go to TalkSober.com, click on the yellow button and sign up and you'll learn those tools. You'll get all the information and you'll be the first to get my book when it comes out. You'll get the digital version and then uh, we're also, I think, going to put it on Amazon and stuff like that. Uh, but I think it's very important that you go through it and you learn exactly what's going on. And I think, I think it's safe to say that your thought process will change if you go through the 30 days. I think it'll really focus you because the idea is the mind is like a, a lens. And my goal in the, the letters, the goal Terry has in the videos, the PDFs, the MP3s, the worksheets, is to focus your mind. If for just an hour a day or 15 minutes a day, just to focus your mind on something else. Just like you sat and listened to us today and you probably felt a little different than you did when you were jonesing about drinking or when you were thinking about this, or when you were trapped in your mind, or you felt like you were suffocating, right? All that stuff, you can redirect your mind. Now, disclaimer, if you've been drinking a lot, or you feel like you really are suffocating, go to the doctor. Always go to the doctor um, when you feel like something like that's happening, because this stuff can be deadly. Uh, but with that said, TalkSober.com is where you can go. Click the yellow button to join us. And um, yeah, we're here every Thursday at 11 a.m. Or 10 at, is it 11 a.m.? 11 a.m. Yes. Eastern 11 time. There we go. Yeah. My brain's not working. Yeah, yeah. Me. Hey, and these, you know, these letters, um, Marcus, uh, Marcus wrote the letters. They're very raw. They're very, they're very, um, uh, you'll, you'll feel what he, what he was feeling. And um, I've, I go through the letters and, and I've done some worksheets on them. I've done videos. So what you're getting is you're getting his perspective and my pr perspective on, on each subject that we talk about. And I think it's really important because you, you may have noticed we kind of have, we we are going, we're both going through sobriety using many of the same tools and we have a slightly different perspective on certain things. And I think it's a good idea because to, to get both perspectives because maybe there's something you relate to a lot with Marcus, maybe there's something you relate to with me, but um, try them out, they're, I, they're great. I read them all the time. <laughs> So, right on. All right, guys. Well, thanks for being here. Hope you enjoyed the Talk Sober show. Hop over to TalkSober.com and uh, check out what we have for you. There's also some free resources for you as well. Um, join the uh, Talk Sober membership. And, um, yeah, I think you'll get a lot out of it. And we'll see you guys next Tuesday, uh, Thursday, next Thursday at 11 a.m. Eastern Standard Time.